Hello, Mr. Hardy here, and in this video I would like to teach you about the poem The Gishmanicht by Keith Douglas. So as per usual, we'll start by reading the poem The Gishmanicht by Douglas. Uh, we'll then check our understanding going through the poem stanza by stanza. Um, I'll then pick out the poem's key message and where we can explore areas of conflict. Um, I'll then identify some key language, structural and poetic techniques you may want to identify in your writing. And finally, I'll leave you with a couple of tasks you can do at the end to really edify your knowledge of this poem. So for starters, who was Keith Douglas? Um, well, Keith Douglas was born in 1920 and he died in 1944 which means he died at 24 years old, which is a really short lifespan. His life was tragically cut short by World War II. Um, he was born in Tunbridge Wells in England, um, and he studied at Oxford University, um, but got called off uh, away from his studies and off to do war. Um, and he served in the cavalry during World War II. Um, unfortunately, he was killed during the D-Day invasion of Normandy, um, and Keith Douglas is remembered as a soldier and a war poet. So first things first, um, the title of the poem, The Gishmanicht, um, it's not English, it's in German, um, and it's the German word for forget me not. Um, one of the things I love about the German language is the ability to compound words, that means you can literally put words together to make the meanings of new words. Um, for example, the gish is forget, mine is me, and nicht is not. So forgish my nicht literally means forget me not, all put together. Um, now forget me not is uh, something you might tell uh, a lover before you go away traveling or before you go to war, you give them this instruction, please do not forget me, I love you. Um, forget me not is also a type of flower. It's sort of like a bluish, sometimes slightly purplish flower. Um, and it's normally given by lovers from one to another when they depart or go away. Or sometimes it's grown in the garden to remind um, the lover of their estranged partner um, and to show that love doesn't fade. They're still remembering their partner. So let's read the poem, The Gish Meinicht by Keith Douglas. Three weeks gone and the combatants gone, returning over the nightmare ground. We found the place again and found the soldier sprawling in the sun. The frowning barrel of his gun overshadowing. As we came on that day, he hit my tank with one like the entry of a demon. Look, here in the gun pit spoil, the dishonoured picture of his girl, who has put Steffi, the Gishmanicht, in copybook gothic script. We see him almost with content, abased, and seeming to have paid and mocked at by his own equipment, that's hard and good when he's decayed. But she would weep to see today, how on his skin the swart flies move, the dust upon the paper eye, and the burst stomach like a cave. For here the lover and killer are mingled, who had one body and one heart, and death who had the soldier singled, has done the lover mortal hurt. So there we go, that is the sixth stanza poem, The Gishmanicht by Keith Douglas. Um, let's go through it stanza by stanza to check we know what's going on. Uh, in stanza one, um, some British soldiers have been sent on a mission, assumingly by their commander, to go find the body of a German soldier. Um, I assume in case there's any intelligence they can use uh, of maybe an upcoming battle or German strategy in the war. Um, in stanza two, uh, the British soldiers remember what the German soldier did to them. Um, and it's described how um, he attacked them three weeks ago. In stanza three, um, the British soldiers, when searching the dead German soldier's body, find his photograph of Steffi. Uh, and in stanza four, uh, the British soldiers refuse to sympathise with the German soldier, even though we discover he had a lover and, and that he's, he's dead, which is obviously quite tragic. Um, they can only see him as an enemy and there's no empathy whatsoever. 
Stanza five, the British soldiers describe the dead German soldier's body, um, and Douglas uses uh, lots of creative techniques uh, to really paint vivid and gory imagery in the reader's mind. And finally, in stanza six, uh, the British soldiers begin to show some empathy um, and sympathy towards the dead soldier and um, his lover, Steffi, back home, who has also died um, in the sense that she has lost her partner. OK, so what is the poem's message? Uh, well, in my opinion, the Gishmanicht by Douglas uh, conveys the reality of war. And this contrasts with the propaganda that was uh, being sort of spread around England at the time. Um, at the time, uh, we needed soldiers to go and fight in World War II. Um, so posters um, and radio adverts and, and other propaganda was used to make war sound quite glamorous. Go fight the enemy, uh, defend your homeland, uh, get to wear a nice military suit with medals. Um, and it was kind of glamorised. Uh, whereas I think in this poem, Douglas really wants to convey the reality of war. There is death, um, there is loss of life, there is loss of love. It is not as good as propaganda makes it out to be. If anything, it's, it's tragic. Um, the Gishmanic by Douglas also criticises uh, war itself um, and how war can desensitise, that means make humans less sensitive, and dehumanise people as well. That means remove people's humanity, for example, their sense of morality, of right and wrong, of love and care towards one another. So this poem um, is found in uh, the conflict anthology. So where do we find conflict? Um, I think on a really obvious surface level, um, there are British soldiers who three weeks ago had a conflict with German soldiers and they were killing each other and now there's dead bodies and bits of weaponry everywhere. Um, if you want to extend that to a wider World War II context, you could talk about the Allies versus the Axis. Um, but I don't think you'll be doing this poem um, any service unless you dig a little deeper. And I think there's some subtle conflict. Uh, war is, is in conflict with our human nature. I think Douglas suggests that humans should be lovers, um, whereas war turns us into killers. Um, and war clearly conflicts with love. Steffi loved her, her German soldier partner. Um, uh, we assume he loved her back. Um, and that love, which was a beautiful thing that may have been symbolised with forget-me-not flowers, um, has now been destroyed because of war. Um, because some generals and some politicians have decided that young men should be sent to war to kill each other. And that has ruined this young love. OK, um, Douglas uses a wide range of techniques in this poem. Um, linguistically, there's repetition of keywords, um, there's metaphor, there's alliteration, personification, simile and juxtaposition. Um, juxtaposition is when you have two opposite ideas um, put near to each other in a sentence. Um, structurally, this poem is made up of six stanzas um, and each stanza has four lines. Uh, a fancy word for a four line stanza is a quatrain. Um, each line has seven or eight syllables. That's true for most of the poem. I think there's one line that's a bit shorter and one line that's a bit longer, but most of the poem is between seven and eight syllables per line. Um, Douglas employs para rhyme. Para rhyme is when half of the rhyme used um, is a full rhyme. Um, it rhymes cleanly, it rhymes well. Um, and then half of the rhyme used is a near rhyme. It it's, doesn't rhyme cleanly. It kind of rhymes in areas, but not fully. Um, and this can create quite an, an unsettling uh, tone because as, as a reader, we like it when things rhyme cleanly, fully. Um, interestingly about the rhyme scheme is, well, there is none. Um, there's para rhyme used, um, but the, the order in which the, the words rhyme, um, there, there doesn't appear to be a pattern. Structurally speaking, um, the poem is, is quite tightly structured, six stanzas, four lines, pretty consistent syllables, para rhyme, and an iambic uh, rhythmic pattern. Um, and this tight structure may reflect sort of the controlling nature of war and, and soldiers and how commanders send soldiers to do battle um, and the soldiers fight and, and lives are lost. Um, and, and it's all sort of structured and controlled. It's almost a sense that war is, is out of the soldier's control here. Uh, poetically speaking, um, 
Douglas makes use of enjambment, caesura, consonants, imagery, and stopping sibilance, sibilance, <laughs> um, and falter and contrast. So before I, I jump into the poem and, and identify all those features and where Douglas has used them, um, I want to teach you some really useful vocabulary for talking about poetry. Um, in a stanza, you can have a different amount of lines, um, and each uh, number of lines actually has a fancy poetic name. Uh, so if in a poem you have a stanza with two lines, you can call that stanza a couplet. Think of a couple, two people. Um, if your stanza has three lines, you can call it a tercet. Um, if your stanza has four lines, you can call it a quatrain. Think of maybe quad in quad bike, four wheels, quatrain, four lines. Um, if your stanza has five lines, you can call it a syncane. Um, if you've learned French, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, cinq is five. Um, a six line stanza is called a sestet. A seven line stanza is called a septet. Um, and if you are musical and play a musical instrument, you might recognize uh, that eight lines are an octave. Oct meaning eight, such as octopus with eight tentacles. That's just a nice, easy way to uh, to spice up your analytical poet poetry writing. Instead of saying in stanza one, you could say in the first quatrain and automatically you sound like a more advanced uh, poetry analyst. OK, so these are all the features um, that Douglas uses, at least the ones that I've spotted. So in stanza one, line one, three weeks gone and the combatants gone. And we have the repetition of the word gone. And I think this is done to to portray the devastating effects of war. Once human life is gone, you can't get it back. That person's dead. And this is emphasised by the word, the repetition of the word gone. Uh, returning over the nightmare ground. So here are metaphors used. Underground is being compared to a nightmare. Again, the propaganda at the time during World War Two is that war is some great heroic thing that young men should sign up to. Whereas Douglas is saying, in reality, it is a nightmare. There is death, there is destruction, it's tragic. We found the place again and found. We have repetition of found. Now, normally when you lose something and you find it, it's quite positive. But all that the British soldiers find are is death and destruction. We, they find a dead German soldier, they find sort of weaponry, they find a scarred land. Um, I think Douglas is suggesting that, that all you can find in war are negative things, death and destruction. There is nothing positive. Uh, and the final line of the first quatrain is, is really significant. There's lots to talk about. The soldier sprawling in the sun. Uh, first of all, you might want to identify the alliteration of the S sound in soldier sprawling in sun. Um, if you want a poetic technique, you can call it sibilance. Sibilance is basically alliteration of the S sound. Um, again, soldier sprawling sun really draws our attention to this line. Um, and this line is a really interesting image. Um, if you gave me the phrase sprawling in the sun, the first thing my mind turns to is people on a beach, um, maybe lying on the sand in the sun, working on their tans. Um, but clearly this German soldier is not having a relaxing holiday in the sun. Um, he's dead. He's been he's been blown open um, by by some British gunfire or British shell, um, and he's dead and decaying in, in a hot sunny field for for about three weeks. He is anything but having a good time on a beach. He's he's dead and in horrible condition. So I think by using sprawling in the sun, which normally has positive connotations, um, Douglas makes this imagery even more shocking to the reader. Stanza two, the frowning barrel of his gun. Um, this is describing the German soldier when he was alive using his gun to aim at the British soldier. Um, and his gun is personified. Um, it frowns. It literally, the, the end of the barrel um, where the bullet and the shell flies out of, in Douglas's mind, has its lips turned down. It's frowning. It's evil. It's looking hostile. Um, now, this line, the frowning barrel of his gun overshadowing, um, as a grammatical sentence, it should all be on one line. But Douglas uses enjambment, and that's when you take one line and you split it over two lines. And I think Douglas has done this so that we end stanza one on the word gun. Um, and that really draws our attention to the weaponry, to the violence, to the death that war causes. 
Um, that way we start the second line with overshadowing. And by putting a full stop after overshadowing, Douglas has used caesura. Caesura is um, when you use punctuation in the middle of the line to pause, and it makes the reader reflect on the idea of overshadowing gun. It's so big, it's larger than life, it casts the whole battlefield in a shadow. Here, weaponry is being portrayed as more powerful than humans, which I think is true. Um, a metal gun can live for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I'm sure you can find one in a museum, whereas the human body is quite delicate. One bullet piercing through the, the correct organ and, and you're dead quite quickly. As we came on that day, he hit my tank with one like the entry of a demon. Here we have a simile. Um, so the German soldier has used his gun or his tank um, and he has fired a shell at the British soldier and it's pierced their metal tank. Um, and it's as if a demon, um, a, a creature from hell has been let loose. Again, young British men um, were being sold the idea that war is glamorous. But here, Douglas is making it very clear it is it's closer to hell. Um, there's demons, there's death, there's horror. Um, and it's at this point um, in stanza two that there is a volta. Stanzas one and two focus on the German soldier. Um, but in stanzas three, four, five, six, we realise that this German soldier was also a lover to a girl called Steffi. And that sort of changes the tone a little bit. Um, I want to draw your attention to the para rhyme, which I've explained as half rhyme and full rhyme used in tandem. Uh, for example, ground and found in lines two and three of stanza one, that's a full rhyme. Gone and sun, that's a full rhyme. Um, and if you want to talk about a rhyming pattern, you'd probably say A, B, B, A for stanza one. But if you look at stanza two, um, the pattern is different. Gun rhymes with one and on rhymes with demon. Um, so here, the, the rhyme in pattern is A, B, A, B. So it doesn't follow a clear rhyme pattern. Um, in stanzas one and two, they're all full rhymes, but we'll discover some half rhymes as the poem goes on. So remembering now at stanza three, this is when the soldier becomes a lover as well, because we learn about his girlfriend or his wife. It's not made clear. Um, the poem literally just says his girl. Um, but in my head, it's, it's his wife or his girlfriend, Steffi. Look, full stop. Um, here, Douglas has used caesura again, um, and this caesura is closely linked with imagery. When you tell someone to look, you're asking them to look at an image. So by using the word look, um, the imperative, the command look, um, Douglas is forcing his reader um, to use their imaginations and picture these horrible images he creates of war. Here in the gun pit spoil, the dishonoured picture of his girl who has put Steffi for Gishmanit in copybook gothic script. Um, here, spoil and girl do not fully rhyme. And this is what we call half rhyme. Spoil, girl. They have the L sound at the end, um, but the vowels that build up to it aren't, aren't the same. Um, whereas for Gishmanit and script do rhyme. So here we have a balance of half rhyme and full rhyme. And I think it, it begins to create an unsettling tone. Um, as a reader, I like full rhyme. It's clear. Um, it makes sense to me, but this half rhyme is a bit unsettling. Um, we learned that Steffi is the name of the soldier's girlfriend or wife. The Gishmanicht, we know, is a German compound for forget-me-not. And what I find interesting is that she has written um, her name and forget-me-not in Gothic script. Now, if you go to Microsoft Word and you change the fonts to Gothic script, you can see what that looks like. Um, but I'm not so much interested in, in how neat her handwriting is. I'm interested in the word Gothic. Gothic horror is a genre, um, and it's a genre that's full of gore and death and evilness um, and horror and terror. And, and these are the, the sort of things that you might find in war. You find evil actions, you find gore, you find horror, you find soldiers who are terrified. Again, Douglas is portraying the realities of war. It's not glamorous, people die, it's like horror. Now, in between stanza three and four, we get a contrast between the picture of Steffi and the image of the soldier. Um, now, we don't know for certain, but in my head, the picture of Steffi is probably of a beautiful uh, German woman smiling. Maybe she's wearing a nice dress, she's combed her hair. She might be in a, in a beautiful 
um, German countryside location. I picture a very perfect idealized image. Um, now contrast this with how the dead German soldier is described in stanza four. We see him almost with content, abased, and seeming to have paid and mocked at by his own equipment that's hard and good when he's decayed. First thing to note is that we have consonants. Consonants is the repetition of consonant sounds. The C sound in content, the P sound in paid, and the D sound in decayed, even the G in good and the H in hard. Um, they're all quite harsh sounds, and I think this is used on purpose by Douglas to reflect the harsh realities of war. It's not a smooth, pleasant sounding stanza, it's a harsh, uncomfortable sounding stanza. Um, looking at that half rhyme and full rhyme, content and equipment rhyme, paid and decayed rhyme, it is full rhyme, but again, the pattern doesn't, uh, there, there is no pattern. So in, in stanza three, um, you would say the pattern would be A, A, B, B, whereas in stanza four, it's A, B, A, B. Um, the dead German soldier is mocked at by his own equipment. That is personification. So the equipment is laughing at the dead German soldier. Now, this is our second example of personification. So I think you could say that Douglas uses extended personification. That means he's using personification more than once. And in both situations, the weaponry, the frowning barrel in stanza two um, and the mocking equipment in stanza four seem to depict that the weapons of war, which are a symbol of death, are more powerful than the soldiers of war, which, in my opinion, are, are a symbol of love. I think Douglas is getting the point across um, that death and destruction are, are powerful in war, as symbolised by the weaponry and human nature, human sensitivity, as symbolised by the lovers and the humans, um, cannot compete with the destruction and the death caused by war. What I find interesting is that the, the equipment here, which I assume is, is guns and helmets um, and, and various other metal equipment a soldier might carry on him, um, the equipment is hard and good. Um, that means even though it's been three weeks since the soldier has maybe cleaned his gun or polished his helmet, um, the metal has endured. It's in good condition. It's still hard and strong. Compare this to the soldier's body made of flesh um, that has a massive hole blown out of it and that's been sitting in the sun for three weeks and is probably rotten and decaying. Um, I think you can use the antonyms, the opposite meanings of hard and good to describe the soldier. The opposite of hard is soft and the opposite of good is bad. I think you could say the soldier here is bad and soft. And again, I think Douglas is saying how the weaponry will outlive the soldier. These symbols of violence are still hard and good. We still believe in them today. We still have wars today. Whereas the humanity, the lovers, um, are soft and they're bad. They're gone. They've decayed away. Douglas is again explaining how war dehumanizes, desensitizes people. And he's really clear about the negative effects it has on humanity. OK, moving on to stanza five. Uh, but she would weep to see today on how his skin the swart flies move. Again, you have alliteration of skin and swart, the S sound at the beginning of the words, um, but you could also pick up the sibilance, the S sound of skin and swart and flies. Um, it almost creates a S sound, like the buzzing of flies, skin the swart flies move. Um, and that makes the imagery come alive to me. I can almost picture that dead soldier in my head with the buzzing flies on him. Uh, the adjective swart just means dark. So um, when I think of this German soldier, personally, I, I picture a, a fair skinned soldier. Um, and then you can have the contrast of the dark flies moving about his decaying body, eating his rotten flesh, laying eggs, whatever these flies do to the dead German soldier's body. Really gory, graphic imagery. The dust upon the paper eye. This is a metaphor. So here Douglas is comparing the German soldier's eye to paper. Um, now, eyes are always meant to be moving um, and they're meant to be wet or, or moist, and that's how they work. But by comparing um, the German's eye to paper, it's suggesting that the, the German soldier's eyes are not moving because paper can't move of its own accord, and that the, the German soldier's eyes are dried, suggesting that he's dead. Um, I think the noun dust as well um, 
really explains that he's he's been dead for a long time. A bit like how if you leave a book on a bookshelf, it gets dusty. Um, this soldier has been left out in the sun. There's dust settling on his body. Um, so again, very gory imagery through this metaphor. War is not pleasant. And the bird's stomach like a cave. Another creative technique uh, that Douglas uses here. It's a simile. It's comparing the German soldier's torso to a cave. So clearly a, a bullet or a shell from a tank or something has blown up this German soldier. Um, and there is where his guts should have been. Um, there is a massive hole in his stomach area, a bit like a cave, um, which indicates it's a pretty massive hole. Again, it's it's really destructive, violent imagery. Um, clearly, Douglas does not approve of war. Um, otherwise, he won't be trying to horrify the reader in such a graphic way with this imagery. Um, today and I move in cave. These are half rhymes. They don't fully rhyme. And the pattern would be A, B, A, B here. Stanza six. For here the lover and killer are mingled. Uh, first thing to note is the juxtaposition between lover and killer. Can you be a lover and a killer at the same time? Um, I think Douglas suggests that we can be. Uh, the other thing to note is the sort of ambiguity, the vagueness here. Um, Douglas isn't clear. Who is the lover? Is the lover the German soldier? Or is the lover Steffi? Or is the lover the British soldiers who may be thinking of their wives and girlfriends back home? It's not very clear. The same question is asked. Who is the killer? Um, is the killer the German soldier who was trying to kill the British soldiers? Or is the killer the British soldiers who killed the German soldiers? Um, or are the killers the people who orchestrate war and, and ultimately are responsible for the deaths of lots of soldiers and the heartbreak of lots of loved ones back home? Um, I think there's a, a purposeful vagueness here. Um, I think this comments on humanity as a whole. As humans, we can be lovers and we or we can be killers. Um, I think Douglas is suggesting that our nature is to be lovers, um, but war turns us into killers. Um, mingled and singled, full rhyme, heart and hurt, half rhyme. Um, again, this pattern would be A, B, A, B. Uh, one thing I would draw your attention to is the repetition of lover. Um, we get it at in line one of the sixth stanza and in line four of the sixth stanza. And by repeating lover instead of killer, I think Douglas is suggesting there is hope for humanity. We can be lovers instead of killers. Love can prevail. But I think in order for that to happen, war needs to stop. Um, speaking of stops, uh, there's end stopping. That's when we have punctuation at the end of the line. Um, the full stop after heart and the full stop after hurt really give the final stanza of this poem definitive ending. And death who had the soldier singled has done the lover mortal hurt. The soldier is dead, love has been hurt, war is bad, full stop. It's a very clear, strong ending expressing Douglas's attitude towards war. Now those of you who have sensitive ears, you may have picked up that this poem has been written largely in an iambic meter. That means de dumb. So um, unstressed followed by stressed sounds. Uh, for example, the final line of the stanza uh, of the poem has done the love a mortal hurt. Um, the second sound is the more dominant one. Listen carefully. Has done the love a mortal hurt. Um, and this pattern sort of carries the poem. It, it's, it, it goes throughout the poem and it lends a rhythm to the poem. OK. What can you do to solidify your knowledge of the Gishmanikt by Keith Douglas? Well, first of all, make some notes from this video on a physical copy of the poem. Uh, second thing you can do is you can answer this poetic analysis question. How does Douglas explore the effects of war on humans in the Gishmanikt? Um, I'd suggest you write maybe an introduction with uh, the poem's message and the ideas surrounding conflict. Um, you may then want to dedicate a paragraph to some of those language devices um, that Douglas has used, repetition, metaphor, simile, personification, alliteration, take your pick, he uses loads. Uh, maybe a paragraph on structure, you might want to talk about um, the quatrains being used uh, and, and the, the tight structure. You may want to talk about the volta and the contrast or the end stopping. Again, you're spoilt for choice with this poem. Um, and then I'd move on to a paragraph that deals with the poetic techniques 
um, enjambment, caesura, um, you've got sibilance, you've got consonants, uh, you've got the half rhyme um, and full rhyme that makes up what we call para rhyme. You've got the fact there's no rhyme scheme, you've got that iambic um, rhythm throughout. Um, there's plenty of things you can pick up on, just make sure you link it to the effects of war on humans. And then draw your conclusions. Um, I think it's pretty clear Douglas has a negative opinion on war, which is expressed in his poem, The Gishmanicht. Um, but I'll be interested to know uh, what conclusions you draw from answering this question. If you like the video, um, please give it a like. Um, please subscribe to my Mr Hardy YouTube channel for more OCR, GCSE, uh, poetry anthology analysis. Um, and please leave a comment if you think there's anything I've missed out that you want to share with me. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you on the next one.